Hello everyone, Mythic here, and welcome back to another Lucium Total War update video. For once, we are finally going to be starting off with South America here, as the factions have come in for the South America 2.0 update, and we are going to get to look at those now. It has been a long work in progress, and I could not be more excited to show them to you, so let's just go ahead and get in. Starting off immediately, you can see we have all of these new factions, including uh, some new flags for some older factions, like the Dutch Empire got a new flag. We also have some new UI down here, but let's run through the factions real quick. So we have the Vice Royalty of Peru, the Vice Royalty of New Spain, the Portuguese Empire, the British West Indies, the French Empire, the Dutch Empire, the Empire of Mexico, the Kingdom of Haiti, the Republic of Gran Colombia, the Empire of Brazil, the United Provinces of La Plata, the Republic of Paraguay, La Liga Federal, the, Chile, the Republic of Chile, <laughs> the State of Bolivia, that's gonna be changed, the Mapuche, the Guinekink, the Alakaluf, and the Tushin. Now, so recently we've started doing the starting positions for most of these factions, and while we're not completed with the starting positions, there are only five factions that I believe still need to actually have their starting positions put in. So many of them are already prepared for showing off. For instance, the British West Indies is one of those that's already ready. We, of course, have our starting capital here, for instance, uh, Governor Lawrence. We have British Infantry because we're reworking how the recruitment system is for regular cities and basically how armies are valued at. Um, real quick, we also lowered the price for Colonial Garrison since we're making Colonial Garrison the bottom tier unit now instead of Farmer Militia. Farmer Militia will still be recruitable only inside of fortifications and really are only going to be used in custom battles if you want to. So your new base unit is now Colonial Garrison and your second tier will be these British Infantry which we're also going to need to do a price reduction at because that is way too steep of an increase. Now moving over here, you have Georgetown, Puerto de España, and then you get over here to the islands. And now you might notice something about all these islands, is these islands are quite populated with forts. And we did that in most of our islands, and the reason we did that is because a lot of these islands are just going to be empty space. We wanted it to be populated, we wanted it to feel like there are strategic areas. Um, and we've actually gone through and populated a lot of the map with these little forts. These forts, for instance, over here in Mexico are going to be little centers of rebellion inside of the um, rebellion provinces. So, for instance, this fort up here would have a Mexican army in it. This fort over here would have a Mexican army in it. And this fort over here would have a Mexican army in it. This is just an example. Uh, and you see that with a lot of these. But over here, there are so many little colonies, cities, and islands uh, that we wanted to just make sure that it was kind of represented. So, we've got all these little forts all across here. And there are way more forts in the Caribbean than you'd expect. I don't know why I said that, but I definitely did. <laughs> Moving on to some more changes. We also have all of the new captain portraits, which have been done for every single faction. So if you want to have a captain and you want to go send him into battle, you'll get to see his beautiful face. It's been redone. Every faction has those now. We have also implemented the European Trade Centers. I did talk about those in the last update video. They're now inside of the mod, as you can see here. These are in a bunch of key locations, such as Lima, uh, Buenos Aires, uh, I believe, yes, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and Caracas. There are some more, uh, but I'm not going to go through all of them. There's like eight. These are the important ones, of course. Another major change, which has recently happened, is all of the new cultures we've added into the mod. So as you can see here, we have Hispanic culture. There's also Franco-Dutch culture. I'm not quite sure why Lima has 25% Franco-Dutch. Perhaps I uh, was not... <laughs> Perhaps I don't know about the extent of Franco-Dutch culture inside of Lima, but perhaps that's also a mistake, so I'm going to need to ask about that. 5% uh, indigenous peoples, 10% nomadic, you can see we've got the pips, and that is basically the same. Every single settlement has gone in and had its, has had its cultures redone, specifically for this reason. Um, a lot of Franco-Dutch. A lot of Franco-Dutch. I'm beginning to believe that might be a mistake. Um, we're certainly going to need to look at that. <laughs> but, uh... Yes, every single region has gone in, it's had its cultures done all nice and pretty looking. Another major work this update has been the massive overhaul to Bolivia. Um, Bolivia has been improved drastically on its actual accuracy. La Paz is now over here in its proper area, so is Sucre. And the other cities, especially Loma Plata, which was all the way down here for some reason. And we've also gone in and improved the borders and just generally added more stuff to the area so that it looks more lived in and... Um, well, like an actual forest, which Bolivia mostly is forests, and mountains, of course. Uh, there were actually a large number of minor border changes in this update, mostly uh, to Contorta Rivers and uh, 
so that they would follow the rivers rather than actually just like bleeding over. Now there is an instance where you can see where there was a bit of a mistake here. However, it was a lot worse and more prolific before the border changes. I am actually going to put up a picture on the screen that shows off all of the border changes that were made between the 1.1 and 2.0 updates just to show the magnitude at which we have gone and improved the borders. And we've also gone and improved the terrain, tried to make that look more natural and realistic. So for instance, um, a lot of this, so this area right here is more forested and green than it was desert originally. The desert stretched all the way down to here. That's not uh, entirely accurate. Uh, the desert actually crosses the mountains and sort of leads into uh, Patagonia. And this is like, this is a weird mix of just really arid shrubland and desert uh, in the real world. So I tried to recreate that with some medium fertility and just some more little trees and plants around the area. We're also going to put some more rivers down here just so it looks a lot more, just so it looks a lot nicer. And another instance of weird border bleed over. See, we've gone and we've had to do a lot of changes. Now, another thing the more astute of you may have noticed is that the resources are actually added to the map now. Uh, so for instance, we've got uh, gold, silver, dyes. If you come down here to this region, you've got sheep, fish on the rivers. You also have tobacco. Yeah, there's some tobacco right there. Uh, you might notice there are some strange camels and some strange dogs. Uh, is that a horse? Or, no, that's a, definitely a wolf. Those models have not been added over yet. The tar is actually a coffee resource. Uh, however, those camels are a coffee resource, like I said, and I'm not quite sure what the dogs are. I mean, it says honey, but uh, there's also just a chance that that was a misname because if you look over here, the camels are named tar. Uh, however, it could just be honey. But yes, there are resources dotted all across the map. Try to be pretty accurate with the resources. So usually we keep like, you know, fish and stuff in rivers, uh, wool in the flatlands, uh, you know, coffee in the places where you expect coffee. So just generally trying to make it a more developed and fleshed out economy. And one thing that we're going to be doing later on is we're going to be adding these ports into the rivers here because we know that there were actually naval battles on these rivers. And so I want to show that off. So we're gonna actually be putting ports here and it should facilitate trade up and down the rivers. Uh, if you look down here, we've actually got a couple trade boats going along the river, and I don't quite know where their end destination is, but I'm sure they've got one in mind. And when they reach that, I, I think they're just gonna go. I really do wanna know what happens when they reach here. Oh, okay, apparently they just disappear. <laughs> Fair enough. I like to think that they're sailing in underground rivers, probably gonna pop out over here all the way in uh, uh, St. George. No, it's Georgetown, not St. George. Tragic. I got it wrong again. And this guy made the map. Talk about it. Anyway, speaking of a few major mapping changes, what you might notice is that there are a ton of changes to the map, which is something we honestly should have gone over earlier, and I'm probably going to put this further up in the video. For instance, you have the state of Pernambuco, which is a starting faction. Uh, we are still debating if we're going to make it playable or not, however they will be here from the start as their actual revolution was in 1817. We're going to be stretching the historical timeline a bit, just like we do with Brazil, because Brazil's revolution was in 1821. Brazil's also going to be a starting faction, of course. And originally we had them up here in Araguiana, but that's just not even close to accurate, so we have actually moved them to their accurate location, which was Sao Paulo. And the same for Pernambuco, of course, which is Pernambuco and Gran Norte. We also found a more accurate map for the uh, Liga Federal, which actually at this time period still owned Cordoba. And so they have a very messy civil war to be fighting with the uh, Argentinians. Uh, Bolivia, of course, is starting here. They have two cities at the start, but they're going to start with three or four armies dotted around the map in various locations to kind of simulate the revolution. Very similar to Mexico, which is going to start with two cities but have many armies all over the place and hopefully able to actually defeat things. Now, while the British got a major expansion, they're actually not that strong since they are so incredibly divided. And uh, that's gonna be a pretty big problem for pretty much any Caribbean power. The British own as far over here as Belize and then far over here as um, Georgetown, which is pretty much on opposite sides of the map at that point. Another nation here is Haiti. You guys have already seen Haiti though, I'm sure from pictures. Uh, another major change down there is the Mapuche. We no longer have the giant brown blob. We have a few little blobs, uh, including the Ginnikink, which have their starting position done, as well as starting forces. The Mapuche have been reduced to five cities. Uh, we have the Tushin here, 
and then we have the Alakaloof along the coastline. And finally, just to talk about a few of the smaller additions, we have these little resources down here, which is something you've seen if you are in the Discord server, link is in the description, go join. We have these native river villages, which are just going to be little fun villages to spice up the environment around the Amazon. And we also have these lost civilizations, which are just a city model of, you know, supposed to represent abandoned cities. They'll provide you a lot of wealth if you find them, uh, as you can plunder them, and they'll be just a natural resource for when you conquer the Amazon. I forgot to mention, uh, Benison made us a lot more new loading screens, which I'm gonna try to show. Oh, like for one, the Empire of Brazil looks sick. There's more for Spain. And then you're gonna get a lot of old ones now, because I'm actually trying to show the proper things. But the, the, these uh, loading screens look great, like Ferdinand II of Brazil. There's a lot about Brazil, there's more. I, I swear, I'm not making it up, I'm not crazy. There we go. Public of Chile, por la razón de fuerza. Very cool. There's also one for Grand Colombia. Also, another major person that got a massive uh, starting position change was Grand Colombia as well. Grand Colombia was wildly historically inaccurate at the time. Um, when Bolivar was going to conquer uh, ba basically uh, Venezuela and try to get independence for it, he landed here and pushed to take Angostura, which is now named Ciudad Bolivar, and then later pushed all the way over here to take Bogota. But originally, we just had him owning Cartagena and Bogota. But now, that's historically fixed. Grand Colombia is going to start with, I believe, six cities now? Yeah, six cities, which is hopefully going to make them a lot more resistant to just getting stomped out by the Spanish. So, which is a big problem we had earlier on in versions of the mod. So, um, yeah, I really have high hopes for that one. <laughs> We're really trying to make it hard for the Spanish, especially Peru. Peru and Mexico should not have an easy time. I want them to be the hardest campaigns in... Lucium history, and I don't know if that's going to be possible, mostly because, um, the Ottomans is just a beast, but, uh, we're going to try. Alright, that's pretty much going to be everything for the Bolivar section of this video. Uh, there were a bunch of little changes to Europe, which we're now going to dive into, but, uh, for the future Bolivars, next time you see this, we should have all of the starting positions down, we should have all of the forts, we should have the resources and the models fixed. We're also still waiting on the models for, um... All of the new factions, so the captain models and the general models, all of them right now are default black or gray. I don't remember the exact color, but we're still waiting on that. We're going to get that done. We're going to get uh, all of the starting positions done. We're going to work on the units. We're going to work on the events. Those are going to take the most of our time from now on. Um, but we're still very optimistic about the uh, release for Bolivar's 2.0. So without further ado, let's go over to Europe. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the European campaign. Now, there are a few small changes we're going to do and a few quality of life updates that we're going to talk about real quick before we hop into the main change for this small update which was the new british script and that's going to be fun because the british script is actually insanely cool i have uh, seen it demonstrated to me and i played it a little bit and i actually really like it so first things first we're going to get over the small things also uh new ui as in the other one might still change the ui a little we're still debating it number one god has blessed us today with the most holy change of all, the Bani Khalid Emirate is now referred to as the Bani Khalid Emirate. This is the greatest change in Lucian history. I have never been more happy. Um, <laughs> so, basically, these guys exist now, and they also have their uh, trait and ancillary. Originally, uh, it was either the trait or their ancillary. It did not work. But it's here now, so that's awesome. We love it. We've also recently added a new feature, uh, which is an event that will allow you to turn off these things, the Central Bank Intervenes event. Now, these events are going to spam you. They happen, like, every turn or every other turn if you're unlucky, and uh, they kind of flood the, uh, the sidebar over here. So we have made an event where these will just not show up. You won't see them. They don't exist. Stop believing them. It's fake. And that's one of our quality of life features. Now, we're going to quickly hop in and look at the British, and then we have one unit change to talk about. Here's the event that I was talking about. This is turn five. You get the HRE harassing you as part of the HRE system. You may notice that you're notified each time an HRE member state is bailed out of debt by the Holy Roman Central Bank. This is often used by the AF frequently, and therefore you must find that have three events every single turn, notifying you of the same thing in each of your fellow member states. By accepting this event, you will form. You will from now onwards only ever receive an event for when your nation goes into debt and is bailed out. Parentheses, AI nations will still be notified of yours. I don't care. By declining this event, you continue to status quo. However, this decision will not appear again. Goodbye. We don't want to see your events. Now, on to the British. The British have a really new interesting event system. This event system basically determines 
what route you're going down historically. For instance, our succession problem. Now we've had the succession event for a while, however, we've added choice to it. So now, you can choose if you want to continue the Stuart dynasty, or, or not continue I suppose, the Stuarts weren't in charge at the start of 1700, but do you want to restore the Stuart dynasty? which might have more legitimate, but at the same time be, you know, deeply unpopular seeing as they're Catholics and Scottish. Or you can select George of Hanover who, while he might not be from here, he is definitely more popular. And so this gives you a little background on them. So that's James Francis Stewart, that's George of Hanover, it'll tell you exactly why, the bonuses, the pros, the cons, what's gonna happen. Also there's a, you know, this would appease Parliament, however there would be no risk of civil war, if you go for James Francis Stewart, there might be a chance of a civil war. However, if you choose this, the Jacobites might rise up against you. So, for instance, so it's going to tell you, by the way, we want to select James Francis Stewart because we're cool and we love Scottish people. And we do not love the harder economy. And the Jacobites are so pumped, man. The Jacobites are so excited about this. The Jacobites are like, let's go. So we're not going to deal with a Jacobite revolt. However, Parliament is not going to be happy with you. And this might increase the chance of an English civil war. And tension in the commons. Upon reading of the declaration that James Francis, son of James II, who they deposed, was to be named as the legitimate heir to the throne, the House of Commons was totally silent. A few cries of God save the king came from the back benches, but they were quickly silenced by those sitting next to them. The Speaker of the House, through restrained tears, declared that Parliament would be adjourned for the time being as MPs walked out of the commons with their heads hung low, cursing themselves as they all realized what this meant for the nation. The king has called for cooperation between Protestants and Catholics in light of this, however many of the sentiment has perhaps been misplaced, and that line may have already been stepped for over many Protestant subjects. Parliament will now begin discussing ways to work around that, what in their view is a truly terrible turn of events. So, James Francis Stuart starts up here. He is the Prince of Wales, uh, because because good old King William is still alive, and King William is Mr. Dutchman himself, the Stadtholder of the Netherlands. James Francis, however, is of the Royal House of Stuart, and you will not have George of Hanover in your country. Um, and this is done by having two branches of the family tree, and the family trees have again gone through a massive expansion. Uh, just to add more of this, so now there's like six British monarchs. But basically how this event works is that you start with two lines uh, here in the family tree, and this is a little messy, obviously not accurate. You've got George of Gloucester, that would be George of Hanover, and you have James Francis, Prince of Wales. Now depending on which one you use, which event you choose, these people will die. So if you choose George of Hanover, James Francis will die, this side of the family will die out. If you choose James, then George of Gloucester will die. Papal endorsement. News has reached us that Pope Clement XI himself has sent his personal congratulations to our king over the selection of James Francis Stuart as his and his wife's heir. This is the first positive acknowledgement of any monarch of the English Prince Pope since the Tudor era more than 100 years ago. To Catholics across Europe, this shows the Pope must think that maybe, just maybe, He misspelled Catholicism again. Could return to England through James Francis. The mere insinuation of this should make the stomachs of all Protestants across England turn simultaneously. Sympathy in Parliament. This is a numerous Parliament events as you continue through the campaign. You can bribe Parliament, you cannot bribe Parliament. These are, of course, chance events, so different outcomes may occur. So we're going to pay them off, of course, because we want them to not be mad at us. Oh crap. They found out. Well. It's blown up into a massive scandal and backfired on our face. Everyone is more unhappy with us because we tried to bribe Parliament. The Scottish Jacobites rally. The pro-Jacobite rallies have held. Pro-Jacobite rallies have been held all over Scotland the last few days, both in the Lowlands and the Highlands, in honor of the future King James III of England and the VIII of Scotland. In response to growing anti-Jacobite movements in England and Wales, our closest advisors have arranged for the Catholics and Scottish nationalists across Scotland to put on these rallies to demonstrate that James Stewart's claim to the throne has popular support. The fact that these were arranged by the King and Queen's officials is widely known, however, and the rallies have done nothing to convince those who are ardently against James Francis Stuart as King to support him. It is, however, shown that opposition to him is very much not unanimous, and any move to prevent him taking the throne will not result in an easy victory for the anti-Jacobites. Tensions rise across Britain. Ah, King William is dead. That means James Francis Stuart is now the King. And because of his death, we now have even more Parliament mischief. The Anglican Archbishops, with the coronation of James Francis Stuart III and Ingham, 
With the coronation of James Francis Stuart as James III of England and Ireland, the 8th of Scotland, as well as the disputed Stadtholder of the Netherlands, James III is now strangely also head of the Anglican Church, despite being a Catholic. This naturally has caused friction between the Crown and the Anglican Archbishops, who fear a conversion of the nation to a Catholic more than anything on heaven or earth. The Archbishops of York and Canterbury, therefore, have come to the King with a simple question. Why did he spell Catholicism correctly there? The question is a difficult one, as the archbishops are extremely wealthy and have offered a bribe of 1,500 gold to swear a choice in favor of no, as well as this the parliamentary opposition to King James III would gain substantial support from the entire clergy if we were to say yes to the question. Any change of the state religion would not be immediate. Much legislature dating back to the time of Elizabeth I would have to be changed to facilitate this. Either way, this question is one on the lips of most of the nation, not solely on the archbishops of York. Yes, it will become Catholicism. Alhamdulillah. Anglican indignation, I do not care. The country will break down. Now, I have for this been advised only to play to eight turns, so I'm going to be leaving the rest of this up for you guys to discover when you actually go through and play this yourself. I would also recommend trying out both routes, as the other route also has equally as many options and choices defining this one. Now, I will say, this is still being worked on, this is still being developed. You are seeing the early stages of this, so... Remember, this might change. Anything you see is subject to change. I would also like to say that um, green screen is my favorite custom battle location, so we're going to be playing on that today. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like the unit changes were massive in this update. The only change that occurred was the fact that the Bedouin Light Cavalry now use their bows, their horse archers, and melee archers. Uh, their model has always had a bow in hand, however, oddly, they did not fire arrows. Uh, that has now been changed, so now our beautiful Bedouins are going to be able to shoot you as well as run up and stick you a few times with their uh, swords. Which, of course, is the job of any Bedouin. We stan our Bedouin horse archers. Alright everyone, that sums up this Lucium update video. We are also sorry for the two week delay on it, but, uh, you know, things happen. And so we were a bit delayed on this, but we hope you enjoyed. Um, there are going to be a lot more changes going on to Lucium South America. It's going to be seeing the vast majority of our effort now put into it over the next couple months, so hopefully we're going to see major changes. And we're also coming up on the one-year anniversary of Boulevard's release, so that's going to be really exciting. So um, we hope you guys are all excited to see what happens in the future of Lucium. And uh, thank you for watching Mythic Out.